All right. Okay. Welcome everybody to the class tonight. Um, we are still looking at Paul's letter to uh, the Galatians. We're in chapter six, and uh, verses. <clears throat> we're in the. We're going to start in verse three. I'm not going to really go into a recap of the first two verses. <clears throat> We'll just start in verse 3 here and see where we go. Um, this is uh, this has been a, a kind of a this is a tough spot. This is a tough place in this letter for me. I, I uh, and I, I'm not uh, ashamed to admit it. Uh, When you look at it on face value and you read these verses, um, they can be really challenging to to um, to understand because on face value they can all almost look as if they're, and we know it's not, and that's one of the great things you know that he can't be contradicting what he said in every other chapter of this letter. <clears throat> So you realize, well, I'm not seeing the Lord here, so you do what you can do and then pray the Lord will do what he can uh, and show you the real, what's really being said here. Um, so let's, we'll start it and, and go where we can. And, and really, chapter, uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 3 We'll read it. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. <clears throat> the uh, more of a literal translation of that is, if a man considers himself to be something, being nothing. It's not, uh, it's not a question. It's not, you know, when he's nothing. You know, he may not be nothing, but... When he's nothing and he considers, you know, it, it, there's no question there. It's if a man thinks himself something, being nothing, he has deceived himself. And, uh, I mean, <clears throat> that's, uh, I'd say that's, that's, that's all of our problems. It's, uh, it's the default setting of the of man it's it's self self perception looking at yourself and convincing yourself that what you see is what god sees convincing yourself that what you see in yourself is something of spiritual value spiritual uh, meaning. So I want to, uh, because this still has to do in the same context with, with what we've been saying, and, and especially the first two verses here, and I think it goes even back to uh, uh, the last part of chapter 5, when he's differentiating between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. That So we're still in that context of, you know, the, the body. Chapter 6, more, more or less, deals with how we, how we relate to one another in the reality of, of Christ. How we relate to one another in truth. And we've been saying that, and I've tried to keep it, keep it kind of before us, that it is basically Paul, Paul letting us under causing us to understand, listen, you are no better than your brother. You have, because, and the reason is, you have no life that is different than the life your brother possesses in Christ. You have no righteousness that is different than the righteousness that your brother in Christ possesses. And so when you see a brother in a fault, that means stepping outside 
of reality, stepping outside of the context of his state of being in Christ, Christ made unto me, then you restore him. You call him back to the reality. You call him back to where he truly is, his true state, his true condition. But the warning is, you must continue in the seeing of the Lord and be secured where you are or you have no ground to stand upon and you cannot restore a brother to the ground you're not standing on. You can't restore them to a reality you're not seeing yourself or experiencing yourself. You can't minister as the body of Christ a member of the body cannot minister as it is intended out from the life that's working in it if it is not holding the head. If it is not in tuned and in agreement with the life that is in it, then it truly cannot function according to the body. Therefore, it can act as if it's not a member of a body. It just has its own life, therefore its own righteousness. Therefore, it's on and he looks at every other member and says, well, I've achieved a place higher than you. No, we're all in Christ and we all possess the same life and nature. And when a brother misses that, when he missteps, when he steps outside of the bounds of that, we should be those grounded in reality enough that we can call them back to such that we can call them back to a participation with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. And we can call them back to such a fellowship that we ourselves are enjoying. If we're not enjoying it, then we have nothing to call them back to. So it is, it is how we relate to one another in truth. Jimmy and I were talking Monday and, and we began to talk a little about the order the order of the Spirit, the order in which the Spirit of God works in our hearts. And I think it, it leads up to these verses, or it will help me to look at these verses. Um, there are so many, <clears throat> and I have been one, who hear this gospel, hear the gospel. And yet... Uh, have a false understanding with regard to living for God or being in Christ or being dead with Christ or all, all of those things. A misunderstanding. Many misinterpret being dead with Christ as our progressively dying. And that's not true. This can possibly cause some of what Paul is addressing in this a uh, portion of the letter to make sense, if, if I can, if I can say it clearly. I'm, I wrote some of this down today. It comes as well, or this speaks to well, as well to the susceptibility of being deceived by others or ourselves to look unto anything less than Christ. Anything less than Christ being such things as trying to die to self, circumcision. Any of those things, anything that we can put our hands on in order to try to manufacture a result. Much prayer, Bible study, whatever. You know, you can put a name on it all night long, but any external exercise that falsely promises the achievement of some spiritual attribute. So when we as believers, sincere in heart, hear terms, righteousness, holiness, love, peace, and then we hear of the effects of those things as well, we are still left with a huge dilemma, having just heard it, having just heard the terms and the words and the truth declared in word and terms and phrases. We're still left with a dilemma while having... While hearing the declaration of the nature of Christ, the point of reference that has occupied my soul's view still remains the same. So I hear of a declaration 
that declares an altogether other life, an altogether other man. Yet the point of reference that I have has not changed. It's still me. Paul calls that the veil of flesh. So what is my point? It, my point is it's a wonderful thing to hear and read the terms that declare eternal and spiritual reality. But there is a danger. There is a real danger to this. In the absence of seeing Christ, in the absence of Christ being revealed in the soul, all we have to work with is ourselves. And we were talking about this Monday. In the absence of seeing Christ as the internal embodiment and substance of those things, those spiritual things, and seeing him as the substance of those things in us, all we have is us. And then we attempt to apply those terms to ourselves. And unfortunately, we can be deceived to believe that we have actually attained something as a result of doing that. See, such deception, and this is what we're going to get to here in these verses, but I'm, I'm trying to just lead up to it. But such a deception is not the result of improper application. We think it is. Failure is not a result of improper application of these things. So we say, well, I've got to do this different, or I've got to do that better. It is the reality, however, of not seeing Christ. Deception and false assumption. For man thinketh he is something. That's a false assumption. And that false assumption is the result of not seeing the right face. Not seeing the proper man. Again, it's not the result of wrongly applying these things. Because these things can never be applied but to one. <clears throat> so the first need after being indwelt with the life of Christ is seeing him. The revelation of Jesus Christ in the soul is the first need. And really is the only need of the soul. But it's the first need. Uh, that's the work of God out from which everything else flows. Everything else comes. Jimmy talks. It's the automatic. It's the result. Out from that, everything happens. In his appearing, we're no long, we no longer are left to apply spiritual reality to the wrong man because we finally see the one who fills up everything of God. And we see that one as our very life. This is what Paul calls the Spirit of God comparing spiritual things with spiritual. What he does is he takes a spiritual thing and he judges it by bringing it face to face with its spiritual embodiment or its spiritual fulfillment. Love, truth, all of it. He brings all of those things just like they brought, it to, brought everything to Adam and he put a name on it. He named it. He identified it. Just like that. The Spirit of God brings us to the face of Christ and brings every term we bring with us, everything, righteousness, truth, holiness. But here's the point. You can't, those terms are not the first thing that comes there. My soul is. My soul must first encounter him because I first have to see who it is that lives who it is that remains in the Father's view, who it is that truly lives unto God. And when that, when that is settled in the seeing of him, then everything I have attempted to define by myself for that false and wrong man is brought and is defined in his face. Is brought to truth, is brought to reality, is brought to its end. It's brought to its testimony, to the goal of its testimony. And that has to happen in our hearts. 
That is why in order, in, in, in true order, Paul gives the catalyst for Galatians 2.20 in Galatians 15, 1, 15 and 16. Galatians 2.20 could have never been the reality in which he lived, the realization of his heart, until Galatians 1.15 and 16 took place. God revealed his son in me. That seeing of truth, the seeing of the person of eternal fulfillment brings a clear judgment into the soul. He is everything. And I have nothing before God but who he is in me. That is Philippians 3. That's the order of Philippians 3. To know him in the power of his resurrection. That's first in order. And there's a reason. Because the first thing I must see is the one who lives. I have to see the one unto whom God looks to define this new creation. I have to see the head of it, the face of it. Or else I will attempt to define it in my own. And that's first. That is first. Seeing Christ is first. That's the necessity at the onset and is indeed the prerequisite to any and all spiritual understanding. Knowing him and the power of his resurrection is the soul finally beholding the one who lives and who by his power is made unto us all that he is by nature. Then we can experience the fellowship of his sufferings. Now listen to those words. The fellowship of his suffering. And be made conformable unto his death. See, we're self-centered enough to think it's our sufferings. So we have to define what those are. Well, well we're going to look at ourselves and our situation. But it's actually Fellowship. It's fellowship with him in his sufferings. What is that suffering? The loss of everything that was before him. The loss of everything that's not him. Because that's what his sufferings accomplished. Putting all else away. Removing every hindrance to true fellowship. When the one who is all, the one who is life and everything else that life implies appears in us, everything else is removed by the stark contrast of his light. His increase effectualizing my decrease. The soul losing or suffering the loss of an assumed gain in the presence of the riches of Christ. Suffering the loss of, of an assumed righteousness in the presence of the righteousness of God. It's suffering the loss of the wrong man. The wrong and contradictory point of reference. But that's only the result of beholding the face and experiencing the revealed presence of the proper man and the one and only life. The letter to Revelation is no different. You'll notice the whole thing begins right there. The one in the midst of his church. How does it have to begin? I mean, we know what's going to happen. We know the whole thing is one age, one creation being taken away, passing away. And then a kingdom and a city coming forth. A heavenly city, a heavenly kingdom that God himself is the light of. But what's the catalyst of all that? Where does that revelation begin? And I saw one in the midst. And he said unto me, Behold, I am the living one. That's the beginning of the letter called the revelation of Jesus Christ. How much more so is it the beginning of our walk of understanding in Christ? Where in the seeing of him there is the removal of everything that opposes him. Everything that is contrary to him. Every age and creation that I'm holding to. Everything. 
I mean, if you go through the letter, you'll see every time it, there's so many come and sees and appearings and uh, I saw and I saw and I saw. That's repeated over and over just to let us know that the revelation of Jesus Christ is a perpetual work of the Spirit to those who will allow him to do his work. And every time the seeing or the appearing comes, there is the removal of one thing and the establishing of another. Hebrews 10 says it. Lo, I come to do what? To take away the first. Establish the second. That's the catalyst of it. And that happens in me and it continually happens in me. Every time he comes, every time he appears, there is the removing of the first. That I have held to. He's already removed it in reality. But I'm talking about in my soul's understanding. He removes everything. By showing me the reality. He removes everything that's not. Now. all right, I've said all of that. Or read all of that. To kind of give a preliminary answer to verse 3. Because the false assumption that leads to deception that's talked about here has but one remedy. And that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. If a man thinks himself to be something, being nothing, he of his own self. No one did it. You understand, no one has to deceive me because that's my, I say this a lot, that's my default. Because when it comes to the things of Christ, the things of the Spirit, anything that has you as a center of it is deception. So I am naturally born with that inclination. That's what I do. I look at me. And I define everything with me in view. And that's what I'm saying. The only answer to that is for the Spirit of God to do the work of His power in us. And that is to bring the true face, the true, the, the proper face into view. And in that, the face that I have held to, the face in which I've defined everything wrongly, is removed. From my soul's view. So I, I look some of these uh, words up and, and phrases, and, and we'll talk about it for a little bit here. The phrase "think think himself." If a man think himself, Strong says to be of the opinion, whether false or not. To suppose, to assume. For most of us, I wrote, for most of us, everything as to our standing and our relationship with God is or has been based upon this same assumption. But as previously stated, it is merely the absence of seeing reality that allows this assumption to remain. Same assumption and deception that he talks about is spoken of in James. The man who is deceived. What is he? He's a hearer of the word but not a doer of the word. And we always, we hear the word doing and we always think of action that we do. What can we apply? How can we implement? But what is actually a doer of the word? Well, it's one that actually goes to the word like he'll continue on to say. Now, the one who is a hearer does this. He goes to the word. He goes to the law of liberty. He goes there and he sees himself. Everything he reads, he reads with himself in view. And he sees himself and goes his way. That man is deceived. That man is deceived. He now assumes that he understands this. He assumes that he understands the words that are addressed here. And he assumes that he can be this. Or he can do this. 
Or he can somehow become the, the evidencing and proving and measure of this by whatever acts or, or uh, religious works. He is under a false assumption because he is beholding a false man. He's beholding the falsehood of man himself. So he is deceived. What is the reason for his state of deception? Absence of spiritual understanding that comes in the revealing of Christ. Until that, we are subject to this assumption. We're subject to deception. We are susceptible to it. We're actually already in it. We, <laughs> basically, we, we, we start there deceived in, in bondage. John Lightfoot says the word deceived implies a subjective fancy that he is caught up in his own fancies or imaginations. His illusions, his self-centered, self-absorbed illusion. How is that so? Because the object of contrast has not come. Reality has not appeared in his soul. The Tyndall translation of this, of, of this verse that we read, uh, verse 3 of chapter 6, actually says it. The Tyndall version, the one that's very difficult to read, says, He deceiveth himself in his own imagination. He's caught up in his own imagination, his own false understanding. I was thinking about it. I mean, it's, it's kind of like offering drugs to an addict. To tell someone who has not seen Christ, but someone who wants to serve the Lord and wants to do right and has, a, has that type of motivation, but they haven't seen the Lord, and we... Say to them, there must be a manifestation. There must be an exhibition of Christ. What have you just done? Well, you've given them a false expectation, first thing, because what you've done is you've set the wrong goal in view. you set the wrong thing in view. You've put the cart before the horse. You're trying to get a man who has the wrong reference point To demonstrate something he can't and never will be able to. And if that is how we are, we need, if that is the presentation we are given, we need to sit down and wait till we see the Lord. Because if you're just waiting to see a manifestation, what that tells me is you haven't seen Christ yet. Because Christ himself is the manifestation of God. And I don't live on earth looking for one to be. I live on earth having seen the one that is. Having seen the only true manifestation and exhibition of reality that there is. So what do we do now as ministry? What do we do now as just believers sharing with one another? We declare that reality to them. And we speak as those who are seeing reality, not those waiting on it, not those looking to exhibit it. We, we speak out from seeing, experiencing, and knowing him to be reality. And we say to that brother, you must see him. Come, let's know him together. Come, have fellowship with us. Come and we will learn of him together. And then we can communicate, as it's going to go on and say, to one another. Out from life, out from reality. Reality. 
And when we do, if that's our state, then when we do see a brother in, in, in a problem and in a fault and stepping outside of that reality, we call him back to it. So he thinks himself to be, to be something. To be there is actually, it's, it's pretty important to this verse, to be. That word actually means to be present, to exist. He looks at himself and assumes that something, and when I look the word something up in the Greek, it means a certain thing, something specific. He's looking for a certain thing in himself, righteousness, whatever it may be, but he's looking for that. And through efforts and through works and through being deceived by those who would have him look at the externals and religious effort to bring himself that brings him back into view. He assumes now that what he's looking for is actually present. That he has and he is what he desires and what he believes God desires. Being nothing. He thinks something that is contrary to reality. He assumes something contrary to reality. The, the, the phrase there, nothing, he is nothing, is actually, again, it's being nothing. It's not he is or he isn't, it's being nothing. I've written here, of, uh, I think this is, from, this is from one of the dictionaries, I didn't write down the reference, but it says, although there is nothing in himself as he assumes. What he thinks he has because he's been fooled to think that this external thing is the evidence of it so he assumes now he has it. If circumcision makes you holy, I'm circumcised, I have holiness. I am holy. I am righteous, whatever. But see, he's assuming on one level and God's knowing is on another. He's assuming from the basis and standpoint of beneath and God's view is above. He's assuming upon the basis of flesh and God's view is spirit. He's assuming on the basis of himself and God's view is Christ. So you can look and assume all you want. God's view must dawn in your heart to know what is. Or or we will all, for the rest of our days on this planet, live under a false assumption and be, by that, deceived and in bondage. The only answer is seeing Christ. The only answer is for him to be revealed. It is this, you know, if you remember the, the square and the circle, the square that had the list of the works of the flesh and then the circle that had the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And I said, these are not two lists describing deeds and attitudes and all of that. This is, a, this is Paul using the most descriptive terms that he possibly can to describe one life and this, or one man, and these terms to vividly describe in the most graphic way another man. And you can say it. He thinks he is this man. He thinks he is the proper man. He thinks he is Christ's. He is an exhibition of Christ. He thinks that he is an exhibition of those lists of attributes. Being nothing. What I, what I want you to see is we never stop being the nothing. That's not even in question as far as Paul's comment here. We never cease being the nothing. The problem comes in when we haven't yet seen the everything. 
then we feel like there's something missing. Yes, there's something missing. It's life. It's the life, the proper life, the only life. It's reality. What you have here is illusions, imaginations, and assumptions. Here, in Christ, Christ himself, there is no assuming. There is knowing. There is who he is. There is the knowing of the Father, the Father's eternal perspective, the Father's eternal view. And until that dawns in your heart, all you have is you and your false assumption. Vines uh, defines deceit or deceiveth here as self-conceit, which is de self-deceit. He said self-conceit, which is self-deceit, which is also a sin against common sense. Now, he uses the word common sense there. I'm thinking, no, that's the actual fruit of common sense. That's the fruit of a man's understanding. What that is, it's a sin actually against spiritual Sense, spiritual understanding. Common sense has nothing to do with this. This is why Paul will go on to say in, in uh, verse 7, Stop deceiving yourself for God is not mocked. God knows the difference. God has already made his judgment. He's already brought his division. He knows the difference between Ishmael and Isaac. And he will never choose Ishmael. In fact, he never recognizes Ishmael. Isaac's the only one. Solomon's the only one on the throne. There won't be another. You can assume that place all you want in your mind, but there's only one who lives unto God. That's why Paul says, I, by the law, dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Unto God means a life that he actually recognizes, something he actually receives. So how do you do that, Paul? What work do you implement to make God satisfied with you? I am crucified. With Christ. Now nevertheless I live. Yet not I. Christ liveth in me. That's how I live unto God. I live by the life. That God receives. That God accepts. God by his spirit. Desires to bring the soul. To the face. Unto which he looks to see all that he desires. That we will no longer live in deception. Self-deception. It doesn't have to be anyone else deceiving us. Paul tells him in Colossians. He said do not be deceived by the philosophies and vain imaginations of men. And here's what he tells them. And I love this. And I think this is a lot of what he's saying here in chapter 6. He says because I. I may not be there in the flesh, but I am by the Spirit beholding your order. What's that mean? Take it back to Balaam and Balak. He beheld the tents of Israel and could not bring a curse upon what God has blessed. He beheld the order of their encampment. And Paul says, listen, don't allow them to make you step outside of that order, that true encampment. I am beholding your order. Why? Not I'm beholding you. I'm beholding your order because I'm beholding the one in whom you live. And he goes on in that and he says, For in him all the fullness of God dwells and you are complete in him. So as you have received him, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up. 
Understand, he's bringing them to reality. Men and even their own natural mind will always encourage them to step outside of the place where they're not the center. To forfeit, to, to walk outside of and rebel against a standing with God that does not have you as its measure or does not have you as its means. The natural mind will always war against that. Because there is a way that seemeth right to a man. False assumption. There is a way he's assuming is right. But the end is death. And this is what this whole thing's about. It is either life or death. It is either, it's either I or, or it's either Christ or me. That's the whole point. That's the whole distinction being made in this whole letter. It's either Ishmael or it's Isaac. It's either the true heir or the one who tries to take the inheritance to himself and it doesn't belong to him. And then verse 4. This is where I had a little trouble. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And every man, verse 5, and every man shall bear his own burden. Now, just, just in verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens. Verse 5, every man shall bear his own. Is that a contradiction? No. Because even the word there, burden in both, they're not the same word. He's not talking about the same thing. That helped to know that. But verse 4, just, I struggled with it because if you look at verse 4, it's almost saying, and it's almost contradicting everything he said, if you read it on face value, and how it's translated, it's contradicting everything he said previously. Throughout the whole letter. Let a man prove his own works and then he will have rejoicing in himself. He will have room to rejoice and to boast in himself. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. What did you say? You said a lot of things contrary to that throughout this whole letter. So what does it mean? Well, you may not agree with it, but this is what I think it means. I wrote it here. Because it's saying here, let every man prove his own work. It's not like I'm proving that my work's better than yours or my work's good. It, the word prove there actually means discern. To make sure. And what I, what I think it means, I, I wrote it so I don't have to remember what I was thinking. I wrote here, make sure that the reality is actually being revealed in you. Again, he is, he's talking about how we relate to one another. And this one thinks he's above this other one because they're falling. They're messing up. They're in a fall. This one says, well, I'm better than this person because, again, until you see Christ, guess what you have? You have yourself and each other to uh, compare. You compare yourselves with one another. So this brother is saying, well, I've done everything. Just like Jimmy said Monday, I've done everything the law said. I've been circumcised. I've done it all. Paul said the same thing. I did it all. But he also said, wretched man I am. Because he couldn't be who the law demanded. He could do what it demanded, but he couldn't be who it demanded. Because it's all about life, not deeds of the flesh, but life, fruit, not works. So I have here written... The, make sure before you go boasting and thinking something of you 
Make sure, here's, here's what you have to concentrate on. Here's the thing that must be paramount in your heart. Make sure that this reality of Christ is actually being revealed in you. And that God is doing his work in you. Make sure God's having his work in you. So that you're not... And so that you are knowing him and growing up in him and knowing the life that you have. To make sure and prove to discern that what you truly possess now is who he is. And not what you've assumed you were. And that in that you are no longer attempting to possess in yourself something you could never be. Then you will not look at another person to compare because you have now seen the true object, the true reference point, and your boasting and your rejoicing is now in the fact and the sufficiency that he is made unto you all things. You can go into several verses where I've just said it, basically. And then, here's what the bearing of the burden is. Every man will bear his own burden. You will be able to minister to them as a member of the body in whom the life of the head is working. Because the word burden there actually means service to. To have an obligation to. Because we do. We have an obligation one to another as his body. Paul says it at the very beginning. Restoring those who are in fault. But guess what else? Edifying one another in truth. So if I'm finally no longer thinking I'm up here, you're down here. I've arrived and you haven't. But now my focus has changed from me and you to him. And now I'm making sure I am seeing the Lord and making sure that he's having his effectual working in me. Then guess what? I can truly be an effectual minister to those who are part of the body. And you, if that is your state, can be an effectual member to me. And every joint will truly supply. Out of the abundance of the head. Now that's my, that's what I've seen in these verses. <laughs> and I think the dog agrees. And that's all I care about. <laughs> now the next verse, uh, I think uh, I'm just going to stop here instead of getting into other verses. But to me this is, this is the whole point. Paul is not contradicting himself. Paul is saying now... I know your tendency is to look at others, to look at yourself and try to assess and try to define and try to measure and try to compare. But you're only, and I said it, I think I said it earlier in these classes in this chapter. Paul wasn't really focusing as much on those who were at fault. He was focusing on the responsibility of those who weren't and saying your responsibility is to keep your eye on Christ. To stand firm in reality so you can call these brothers back to it. And I think that's, he's going on with that same thing. He's realizing we are a body. It's not just a foot trying to grow as big as it can. It is a body that is to be filled with the increase of one life. And if we are knowing that life and that life is having its work in our soul, then we will truly minister to his body as he wills, as he works in each part. I mean, that is truly the gift of the Spirit. That's what the gifts are the manifestations of the Spirit is all about. It's the body functioning according to the need of the body to edify it and bring it to reality. That's what it's about. It has nothing to do with I'm this part of it and you're that part of it. I'm this and you're that. No, it has to do with one life flowing in every member as he will. 
And all Paul's saying here is, let's make sure that we're knowing the life. Let's make sure that life is actually having its operative effect in us. Let's make sure that we are being established in the truth and in the, upon that true and solid foundation so that we can call those who may not be back to it. Because we are called to such an obligation as members of one body. And then he goes on and he says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now, I won't get off into that, but uh, many people have wrongly defined that. And I don't think he's talking about tithing to the church that you get fed at. Most commentaries do think that. That you pay your tithes or your homage to those who... Uh, who you receive the most spiritual benefit from. Well, I, you know, I have no problem with that. I'm just saying that Paul, uh, that's not what Paul's saying here. Communicating is not given money any more than seed is given money. Christ is seed. Well, the communication here has to do with Christ as well. Um, so I won't get off into that verse, but I, I, I just, uh, again, you know, these, these verses have been kind of a struggle for me, or at least four and five, because, again, you can't, you can't look at these things on face value and, and just look at one translation and say, okay. I mean, you have to look at other things, but you also have to say, Lord, I know this is a testimony of your son. I know this is not talking about me doing something or are, are achieving something. It has to be all about Christ in me. So reveal your son. So uh, this is what I've seen thus far in these verses. And if you um, have seen something different and would like to share it with me, please communicate with me. Call me. Uh, uh, email me. Text me. Whatever. And we'll talk about it. You can ask me questions about it. I can't say I'll give you good answers, but uh, you can at least, uh, we can com at least communicate. So uh, I think we'll end, we'll end the class here tonight. Uh, again, we're in Jimmy's house tonight because of the, the weather. Hopefully, if there's not a front coming in, there there's some, some people saying there may be another front coming in uh, by the weekend, and uh, we'll see how bad it is. So just keep an eye out on the page and We'll let you know if we're having the Sunday session. I'm hoping we do. So uh, until then, until next time, appreciate you being with us. Amen.